As real estate continues to become more and more institutionalized, the expectations of incoming analysts at private equity real estate firms have risen higher and higher over the last few years. And at this point, a solid understanding of real estate finance is absolutely critical to landing a position in the commercial real estate industry. And while most private equity real estate firms will administer some sort of an Excel exam during the actual interview process, where you'll have to sit down and build a model based on a sample case study and assumptions, some firms will also wanna test how you think on your feet in conversation during the rest of the interview process. And while these questions generally test your knowledge of the main key real estate finance calculations, some of the most commonly asked questions around these topics can get pretty tricky. So to help with this, if you find yourself getting asked a tough question on the fly without access to Excel, in this video, we'll walk through three of the most common topics covered in real estate private equity interviews outside of a timed Excel exam, sample questions you might be asked on each of these topics, and the answers and logic behind each. So for the most part, commercial real estate interviews tend to be pretty behavioral in nature. Most interviewers are primarily going to be focused on what you've done in your career, your educational background, and the hard skills you have that can add value in an analyst or associate role from day one on the job. But with that said, some interviewers will also wanna test your technical knowledge on the fly, primarily to see how you perform under pressure and how deeply you understand core real estate finance concepts without Excel at your disposal. So to help you prepare for interview day, if this does end up being the case for you, in this video, let's walk through three of the most commonly tested interview topics outside of a timed Excel modeling exam and sample questions and answers for each. So the first topic that's often tested in private equity real estate interviews is going to be your understanding of the internal rate of return or IRR. At a private equity real estate shop, this is going to be one of the most, if not the most important metric used by analysts on a day-to-day -day basis. So a solid understanding of both what the IRR is and how it works in practice is critical for any analyst stepping into a new role. And in simple terms, you can think of the IRR as the annualized time-weighted return on equity invested, and the time-weighted portion of this definition is important because the IRR takes into account the time value of money, meaning that $100 received today is worth more than that same $100 received five years from now for the purposes of this calculation. And with that, most questions around this concept will test your understanding of how that time value of money plays into this calculation and how the timing of your cash flows is going to affect your returns. So for example, a common question on the IRR might be something like this. You invest $1 million in two different projects. Project A produces $100,000 in operating cash flow every year for five years, and you sell the property at the end of year five for $1.5 million. Project B, on the other hand, produces $0 in operating cash flow every year for five years, but you sell at the end of year five for $2 million. So at the end of five years, which project has the higher IRR? And the answer to this question lies in exactly what we just talked about with the timing of the cash flows. And because of that, Project A, or the deal generating cash flow each and every year, wins out in this scenario, even with the sale value being 33% higher in Project B. For each project in this example, the total profit on the deal is $1 million. But with all else being equal, the IRR of a project is going to be higher when cash flows are received earlier on in the hold period, making project A the winner with distributions starting a full five years earlier than any cash flow is received in project B. The takeaway here is that if you're asked to compare the IRR between two projects with identical or very similar profit numbers, the project where cash flows are received earlier on in the hold period is usually going to be your winner and the project with the highest IRR. Now, another IRR-based question to prepare for is similar to the first, but this question actually tests your understanding of the return of capital concept and how that concept applies to the IRR calculation specifically. And to test your understanding of this, another question that might be thrown your way on the IRR is the following. You make two real estate investments, Project A, where you purchase the property for $1 million today and sell the property for $1 million five years from now, and Project B, 
where you purchase the property for $1 million today and sell the property for $1 million 10 years from now. Which deal has the higher IRR? Now this is actually somewhat of a trick question and the answer here is actually neither because investments in both Project A and Project B just represent a return of capital, not a return on capital. So to explain this, let's head back to the definition we used earlier on in this video. The IRR represents the time-weighted annualized return on equity invested. And this means that in order for that IRR to be a positive value, the deal needs to provide some sort of return on that investment in the form of some sort of profit on the deal. And in both scenarios here, where $1 million is invested up front and $1 million is received several years in the future, the total profit is $0 in both cases, meaning that there is no return on equity and the IRR is going to be 0% regardless of the timing of when that $1 million distribution occurs. So the bottom line here is, if you're asked an IRR-based question, the first thing I would ask yourself is, what is the overall profit on the deal? And then ask yourself about the timing of the cash flows if that figure is greater than zero. So the IRR is a very commonly tested topic, but one of the most fundamental calculations in all of commercial real estate is next on this list, and that is the capitalization or cap rate. And the cap rate is a much simpler calculation than the IRR and just measures the net operating income or the NOI on the deal divided by the value of the property. So for example, if our NOI is $50,000 and we buy a property for $1 million, we can divide that $50,000 NOI value by our $1 million purchase price to calculate our cap rate of 5.0%. But for interview purposes, again, companies are going to want to know not only that you know the formula here, but also that you can apply that formula and spot cause and effect relationships between changes in cap rates and valuations of commercial real estate deals. So as far as questions that might be thrown your way on this topic, you might be asked in the interview something along the lines of the following question. If cap rates rise from 5% to 6% in a market, by what percentage will the NOI of a property in that market have to increase for property values to stay the same? And it might seem like you need to bust out Excel or a financial calculator to solve a problem like this, but the solution here is actually pretty simple. For values to stay the same, the percentage change in both cap rates and NOI values also needs to be the same for both metrics in either direction. So to use this case as an example, if cap rates rise from 5% to 6%, it might seem like cap rates have only risen by 1%, but when we actually look at that 1% change as a percentage of the original 5% cap rate value, cap rates have actually risen by 20%, not 1%. And because of that, this means that the NOI of properties in that market would also have to increase by exactly 20% just to keep values where they were at that 5% cap rate figure if cap rates were to shift up to 6% today. And to put this concept into practice using concrete numbers, we can use that same sample property mentioned earlier with $50,000 in annual NOI. If cap rates are 5%, we know that our value is $1 million in this scenario since $50,000 divided by 5% equals $1 million. However, if cap rates all of a sudden rise to 6% in the market, that $50,000 NOI would now only result in an $833,000 value. And to get that value back up to that seven-figure valuation, the NOI on the deal would need to jump by 20% up from $50,000 to $60,000 since $60,000 divided by 6% equals exactly $1 million. The question here is really looking to make sure that you know that NOI values and cap rates need to move in proportion to one another for values to stay constant. And if you think of these changes as percentage increases or decreases within each variable, this will make the mental math of solving these kind of problems significantly easier. And finally, outside of the IRR and the cap rate calculations, another commonly tested subject in private equity real estate interviews is the equity multiple or how many times over an investor earns their equity investment back over the entire life of the deal. Now, unlike the IRR, the equity multiple does not factor into play the time value of money, which means that for the purposes of this calculation, all cash flows are treated equally regardless of the time at which they occur. 
And to calculate this metric, we need to take the sum of all positive cash flows generated by the property throughout the entire hold period, and then we need to divide this by the sum of all equity investments in the property as well. And to test your understanding of this metric, a question you might be asked could sound something along the lines of the following. You purchase two properties for $1 million today, you receive $50,000 in annual cash flow for each year you hold each deal, and then you sell each property for $2 million, but you hold property A for seven years and only hold property B for five years. Which deal has the higher equity multiple? And with all else being equal, since the equity multiple is measuring the total sum of all positive cash flows throughout the entire life of the deal, the answer here is property A, even though the sale proceeds in this scenario won't be received until a full two years after the scenario in property B. With the IRR calculation, this timing matters and property B would generate an 18.8% .8 IRR while property A would generate just a 14.3% IRR simply due to the timing of the sale. However, the equity multiple is going to be highest for a deal that generates the most total cash flow in proportion to equity invested and since property A will have two more years of generating that $50,000 of cash flow than property B, the equity multiple on property A ends up winning out with an extra $100,000 in total profit, bringing that equity multiple to 2.35x versus the 2.25x equity multiple for property B. The bottom line here is that the equity multiple will be highest for a deal that can generate the most profit in relation to equity invested regardless of when those cash flows are received. So at the end of the day, most private equity real estate interviews will leave the majority of the technical questions for the Excel exam directly, but in case you do end up in a scenario where you have to think on your feet during the interview itself, these are three concepts that are most commonly tested outside of a normal Excel interview exam and some sample questions and answers that might be thrown your way on each topic. And if you're going through the application or interview process right now and want to make sure you're ready for interview day or an Excel modeling exam at a top private equity real estate firm, as always, make sure to check out Break into CRE Academy, which will give you instant access to practice interview exams and case studies, in-depth modeling training on in-demand skills like pro forma modeling, development modeling, and equity waterfall modeling in Excel, and additional one-on-one -on -one email based career coaching to help you navigate the job search process based on your own unique situation and goals. And if you like this video and want to see more content like this on the interview process at real estate, private equity, brokerage, or lending firms, make sure to hit the like button to let me know. And let me know in the comments any on-the-fly questions you've been asked during the interview process for real estate analyst or associate roles. As always guys, thanks so much for watching. I hope you found this helpful. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already to see more videos like this every single week and I'll see you in the next video.